This Knowledge at Wharton podcast and videocast is brought to you by Wharton Executive Education. For more information on Wharton's executive programs, such as the Executive Development Program, Leading and Managing People, or the new High Potential Leaders course, please visit executiveeducation.wharton.upenn.edu. Although the subprime crisis seems to be showing some signs of easing, debate over what caused it, whether it could have been prevented, and how long it might last will continue for some time to come. Knowledge at Wharton asked Wharton Finance Professor Richard Marston for his perspective on the latest economic developments. Welcome, Professor Marston. Oh, glad to be here. L- looking back over the past few years, risk premiums have fluctuated dramatically, and uh, most people don't understand what this means. Can you explain it? Well, it's natural for over time for markets to uh, change um, in terms of interest rates, in terms of uh, the spreads of riskier assets over uh, U.S. government bonds, um, to see the stock market fluctuate. Um, in the case of bonds, though, it's, um, it's much easier to understand what's going on in terms of being able to measure what, what is happening and in that we have the, the spread of interest rates between uh, riskier bonds and uh, treasury bonds. And if you watch the spread over time, you can get a good indication of what the market is, actually thinks is happening in terms of, of, of risk. And uh, recently, prior to the crisis, uh, the spreads on high yield bonds and emerging market bonds um, came down to much lower levels than normal. So people thought the market is not that risky. That's right. If you look at the spreads uh, winter uh, a year ago, what you find is that the spreads on high yield bonds had come all the way down to two and a half percent. Now the average spread in the long run is something like five to six percent. So the market was saying that. Uh, High yield bonds, the bonds of corporations with lower credit standing, were were simply looking much less risky than they normally are. Um, the spreads on emerging market bonds had come down to 1.6 percent, and once again, what we're seeing is uh, the market saying that emerging market bonds are just much less risky than they have been over the last 10 or 15 years. Now, the market was saying that they were less risky. Were they really less risky, or was this just uh, looking at the market with? rose-colored glasses. That's, uh, you know, that's how judgments differ in the market. Um, I felt a winter ago that uh, the spreads looked uh, very unattractive to me as an investor. Um, In fact, I was recommending to investors that they actually invest um, 0% in emerging market bonds, that the spreads had come down so far that there simply wasn't enough reward for the risk. On the other hand, if the market as a whole is pricing securities that way, that means there's an awful lot of the people in the market that disagree with me. That's what makes a market. And what were we shown when the subprime uh, market uh, crisis began? Well, what we found is um, is that uh, it was like a, um, a fire. We need a spark to set the fire, and uh, the spark ha- happened to be in subprime loans. If it hadn't been there, it would have been some other security. But uh, once, the, um, once you see the, the fire start, uh, everyone starts to realize it's going to spread. It's going to spread to other types of securities that have nothing to do with mortgages. And uh, what happens is um, risk is reassessed by the market. And uh, securities that would have had a spread of 4% just a few months ago suddenly have a spread of 7%. And uh, this happens normally. It, It happened back in 1998 when there was a financial crisis that actually began in Russian government bonds, of all things. Russian government bonds, what the Russians decided to do is default on many of the government bonds. And as soon as that default occurred, of course, the Russian bonds were not worth very much, but immediately the bonds of other emerging markets were suddenly reassessed, and people wouldn't buy the bonds at the original prices. They insisted on much higher interest rates. And then soon thereafter, other securities were reassessed, high-yield bonds in the United States, um, Danish mortgage-backed bonds, of all things. Um, and what we're learning is that this financial market of ours is very interconnected. And uh, when you see a, a reassessment of risk of one security, the market then very quickly reassesses risk on other securities. This time it was subprime loans. And what does that have to do with high yield bonds and why, why were high yield bonds then repriced? So there was just a general aversion to risk at the time That's that caused right. all of these r- bonds that were perceived as riskier to fall in price and make their interest rates That's rise. right. And what we had was a reassessment of risk, and it affected a lot of securities that had nothing to do with mortgages. 
Now, one of the things we've seen uh, in in the in the past few months or the past year is that the prices of of many uh, debt securities have fallen tremendously, even though there haven't been that many defaults in many of these categories. And and uh, if if the the issuers of the bonds are still making the payments they originally promised, it seems like uh, these ought to be a good deal at these very low prices. And yet there seems to be this t- tremendous reluctance of investors to buy them, even at these deep discounts. Well, what has caused this when there haven't been so many defaults? What we worry about is, um, is the future. What we worry about is... Um, how well the securities are going to do in the future. And that's what the price is supposed to be indicating. That's what this, the spread of the interest rate over Treasury is supposed to be indicating. And if, if we see the economy slowing down, and we're certainly seeing that at this point, um, and we see the risk of further turmoil in the financial markets, which we certainly were seeing in last fall, we were seeing in uh, during the winter, we were seeing it into March. We were seeing the possibility that the that the deteriorating fixed income market could get even worse. And as a result, people were, were not taking chances. They were bidding up the spreads of high yield bonds. Uh, they were bidding up the spreads of, of emerging market bonds. Um, it wasn't just mortgage-backed securities, and that's a natural development. Um, and then, of course, there was the rescue of Bear Stearns, and that turned the tables. Yes, the Federal Reserve has gotten involved, and, and the rescue of Bear Stearns was the most obvious example or the most prominent in the news. It's also done a lot of other things, like uh, lending to securities firms, U.S. Treasuries, and taking riskier mortgage-backed securities in trade as collateral, things it doesn't normally do. Uh, are these a good idea, a bad idea? Are they working or not? Well, let's let's start off with what a bank normally does and has been doing for um, in the case of the Bank of England for over 120 or 30 years, and that is to uh, buttress the banking system whenever there's a danger within the banking system. And what the Bank of England learned they had to do in the 19th century and what the Fed is, has been doing since it was founded is stepping in whenever there's a liquidity crisis, when banks are running short of, of funding and they need some additional funding from the central bank. And that's a traditional banking function, and you could see that very dramatically in August. This is before the Federal Reserve started lowering interest rates. The Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank, in concert, uh, moved into the market and started to flood the banks with, with, with liquidity. And that's very important because what was happening at the time is the interbank rate in the LIBOR market, the London interbank market, um, those interest rates were going very high. Traditionally, LIBOR rates have an average uh, spread over treasuries of about 50 basis points, half a percent. But in August of last year, the spread went up to 2.5%. And that's basically sending off alarm bells, saying that the banks are in distress. They don't trust each other. Um, The the system needs more liquidity. So the Fed stepped in and provided liquidity. That was a very traditional banking function. Of course, that wasn't enough, because later in the fall, what we found was um, that um, the banks and the investment banks were we're having some difficulty with um, funding the positions. And the Fed expanded its role, not as dramatically as it did it this spring, but basically expanded its role to taking in securities that they normally wouldn't have taken in as, in trade. Uh, once again, rather traditional banking function, uh, trying to buttress the banking system. And um, that kind of thing would have worked and solved the problem 20 years ago. What's changed? What's changed is that in the meantime, we've, uh, we've um, had a revolution in securitization. And what has happened is the uh, banking institutions, including investment banks, have learned about ways to fund investments, fund uh, securities, uh, in ways that were really not tried in the, in the early 1980s. And this has allowed the, um, for example, in the mortgage market, it's allowed the mortgage market to expand much more dramatically than it could have otherwise. So what uh, mortgage brokers do is they originate the securities, package them together, the banks package them together, and then sell them to, uh, to pension plans and so on. Um, this has opened up tremendous possibilities for the financial markets. Uh, but it's also changed the role of the central bank in terms of what they have to do in a crisis. Now, the first time we saw this was in uh, 1998 again. 
1998, we had the Russians default on their government bonds, and soon uh, bond markets for a lot of securities having nothing to do with Russian government bonds froze up. Soon thereafter, we saw that major hedge fund in New York, um, long-term capital management, ran into trouble. So why would we care whether or not a hedge fund runs into trouble? Well, it turns out that the hedge fund is highly leveraged positions has many of the same securities that the banks are holding and many of the same securities that the investment banks are holding. So um, in some sense, securitization has made the system much more interconnected than it was before. So the Fed could have stuck to its normal role and said, oh, we're only responsible for commercial banks. And um, that would have been interesting to see what would have happened. It wouldn't have been pretty. But the Fed had an ingenious solution then. What they did is they organized a meeting down at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York and Lower Manhattan and invited the CEOs of virtually every major bank in the United States and many of the banks in Europe. Called them to meeting and said, uh, basically, as, as we understand it, um, wouldn't it be a good idea for all of us if you were to fund a rescue of this hedge fund that is about to go under? Wouldn't it be a great idea if you, Merrill Lynch, and you, Citibank, and uh, you, Smith Barney, were to put up $300 million each? And of course, everyone around the room, with a few exceptions, including the head of Bear Stearns, said, uh, gee, that would be a wonderful idea because this would be in our interest, be in the interest of our shareholders. And so the Fed, in a sense, finessed the problem of, um, of a crisis being so large that it was no longer enough to be a traditional central bank. They finessed that problem by organizing a rescue, which didn't involve any Federal Reserve money. One of the concerns back in the long-term capital management crisis was that uh, the, the hedge fund owned so many bonds of different types that if it went under and ended dumping them on the market at fire sale prices, it would cause prices of other banks' holdings to collapse, and there would be kind of a domino effect. That's, that's exactly That's the right. concern. Yes. Okay. And that's the reason why the CEOs of these major firms, what they said to themselves is, is it in the interest of our shareholders and our management to provide $300 million each? And uh, almost to the last person around the table, they came up with the money. And um, in a sense, the Fed finessed the problem that time. And very brilliantly, by the way. I was always a fan of that rescue. Uh, this time, it's different. Now, this time, mm -hmm. as it, it's, uh, it's sort of built on that, it seems to me, it's a little yes. more extensive. How, how yeah. so? Well, um, once again, what we had was an institution getting into trouble, a much bigger institution. We're talking about Bear Stearns, one of the major investment banks. Um, but a lot, of the, um, a lot of the situation was very similar in the, in the sense that Bear Stearns was holding securities in a highly leveraged portfolio, which were also being held by Citigroup, by Merrill Lynch, by Goldman Sachs, by UBS, by many of the banks of the world and investment banks. And so uh, what the Fed could do, the Treasury could have done, was to say, well, Bear Stearns, it's not the biggest investment bank in the world. Um, let's let the market work here. And um, the great thing is that the head of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, has actually done a study of what happened the last time the federal government let the banking system go down in a domino effect. And his study of the, of the Depression was, of course, one of the major studies of that period. And um, I think that informed him a great deal about what to do in this crisis. Because the worry is that if you allow Bear Stearns to go under, you allow them to dump all their securities in the market. Remember, this is a very highly levered firm. Uh, what happens is an awful lot of other firms in the United States as well as in Europe and elsewhere in the world are at risk. And subsequent to the Bear Stearns uh, uh, rescue, there have been other things that they've done, and some of them preceded that, which was making, basically making money available to keep liquidity in the market. Uh, are, are these things that we're going to need on a continuing basis, or do you see this crisis abating and uh, going back to the sort of the practices that preceded it? Well, let me uh, put my neck out on the line and say, this episode, we've probably seen the worst. And we probably do not have, I may regret these words, but we probably do not have another Bear Stearns lurking during this crisis. But that doesn't tell us that we don't have a problem in the future because when you think of it, um, we're going to continue to have securitization. In fact, we might have increased leverage in the future. And we haven't solved the problem of 
um, how does a system that has been set up, a system of regulation, to, to watch over commercial banks and leave hedge funds and leave investment banks relatively unregulated, how is that system going to withstand the next crisis? Now, the next crisis might be 10 years from now. It might be a totally different um, administration. Of course, it will be a new administration. Um, it'll be a different set of actors. A lot of the regulators would have retired. We'll have a new, new breed. Um, but the same issues will occur again. And the question is, in a um, highly integrated financial sector with uh, a tremendous amount of securitization, high leverage, more leverage outside the commercial banking system than inside it, um, is it possible to have another Bear Stearns? And the obvious answer is, of course. And the question is then, how would we handle it the next time? Would it be a bigger problem next time? So we're faced with an issue of whether or not the old system of regulation is going to continue to work in the future. And that's, that's the nub of the problem. Uh, the, the sort of extreme view on, on one end of the scale is that, well, uh, many of these big institutions suffered enormous losses, and uh, chief executives lost their jobs, and there's been, there's been a lot of bloodletting, and that alone should be lesson enough to uh, not... not get out on this limb in the future. But you think that's probably not enough, just leaving the market to sort it out we, by we itself. Have to, you have to remember that uh, the people who have learned this lesson will no longer be in leadership positions five, ten years from now. We'll have a new, uh, a new group of people. There's a lot of turnover in the financial services industry. The careers are relatively short. And so what we'll have are, are people who are traders today will be running the firms ten years from now or so on. Uh, the question is, what, what do we learn from history from the LTCM uh, episode? D did hedge funds learn that they had to be much more careful? Well, the next couple of years, yes, they probably learned. But do current hedge funds uh, behave um, differently than they did in the late 90s because of LTCM? The answer is probably not, probably not. There's, um, there's a short memory in the financial markets, particularly if the rewards are tremendously large. And they are for the individual players as well as for the shareholders, but particularly for the individual players. If you take some chances, and let, let's, we, let's look at the uh, previous five years. Suppose you were one of those people that were very risk averse and you were in charge of fixed income at one of the major houses. You saw the spreads come down and down and down and you pulled back and you said, well, this institution, I'd like to maintain a more conservative position. What would have happened to you within the industry? The answer is you probably would have had a fairly short career and I could name some names of people who, whose careers were shortened during this five-year period um, because they were a little more conservative than, than their peers. Whereas on the other hand, if you take your chances and if you make your money and over the five-year period, there's some very large bonuses to be had, um, and then the system blows up, you're still much better off, aren't you? Well, it certainly seems As an individual that actor. Certainly, many of the CEOs who, who left in shame left with a lot of money in shame, and uh, uh, they're, they're not out selling pencils. Um, now, as you mentioned, the regulatory system is, uh, well, it seems to be kind of a patchwork that's been built over the decades, parts of it originating back in the 1930s. And now we have, with the repeal of Glass-Steagall some years ago uh, uh, and, and, and other changes, we have different kinds of firms getting into lines of business that at other times they were barred from. And uh, the result is apparently a, a lack of regulation in some of these areas. Do you see that there needs to be some change in the regulatory structure? I think the answer um, should be obvious to everyone, but I'm not sure that it will be obvious to Congress and the new administration, is the following, that um, in this episode, what we found was that the Fed had to, to stretch its uh, mandate in order to rescue the system. Um, the Fed had to go in and provide funding to an investment bank, which traditionally has been outside of the purview of the Fed. Um, this is not like uh, trying to rescue a commercial bank in 1980 because they're having funding problems. This is very different. It's going in because you know that the portfolio of securities of this investment bank uh, is being held by commercial banks as well as by other investment banks, and the financial sector as a whole is in danger. That's expanding the Fed, Fed's role, and if you're going to expand the responsibility, I think you have to expand their ability to oversee these institutions.
And I think it has to be done wisely. And you have to think very carefully about what kind of regulation would be necessary. And clearly, um, many of us believe that the less regulation, the better. But once you have the Federal Reserve committing, potentially committing taxpayers' money, um, you then have to say, well, does the Federal Reserve have to play more of a role in regulation? And, and this I would mean regu that, regulation of investment banks. That's right. Regulation yes. in terms of thinking through what kind of capital requirements are needed um, if you're an investment bank as opposed to a commercial bank. I noticed uh, uh, one assessment said that Bear Stearns had a leverage of something like 33 to 1. So for every $33 it had at risk, it really only had $1 uh, uh, in, in real capital. Uh, is that too much? Is that something that needs to be overseen? Well, that's something that, um, that's for the details of the regulation. But clearly, commercial banks would not be able to get away with that kind of leverage. Commercial banks definitely have a lot of leverage, but they wouldn't be able to get away with that much leverage without having, I mean, we have a whole set of rules, international rules. Uh, for banks on how much capital they have to hold behind each type of asset. We also have to reconsider the um, oversight of off-balance sheet entities on the part of the commercial banks as well as the investment banks. Um, can we sit, sit back and say, oh, it's all right for a commercial bank to set up an off-balance uh, sheet entity as long as they don't formally commit to rescuing those entities? Well, this episode's taught us some things. Uh, when push came to shove, the banks, many of them, stepped in and took over the, the entire book of these off-balance sheet entities, pulling them into their own balance sheets. That means that, um, in a sense, they're now under the purview of the Federal Reserve. And, and I they, think we ought to have to rethink that. The, the banks really had to do that or nobody would do business with them in the future. Yes, right? I'm certainly right? not so, criticizing the banks for right. trying to protect their, their good but reputation. By using the off-balance sheet entities, they were carrying, in fact, liabilities that they didn't show. So That's exactly People right. looking at the banks didn't really have a clear picture of the risk there. Yes. So transparency is always one of the early things you want to do in a crisis to make sure people understand risks, even if you're going to let them take them. Is that right? That's exactly right. And that's what we want to uh, guard against in the future, making sure that there's much more transparency. You would have thought we would have learned from uh, Enron that uh, off-balance sheet entities can be dangerous, particularly if we're talking about the major commercial banks of this country. And yet we don't seem to have learned enough lessons from, from Enron. Now, there's also been some talk about the way the mortgage business has evolved. And uh, we have companies that are uh, initiating mortgages and others that are bundling them up into securities and uh, mortgage brokers. And many of these are, are sort of unregulated, or at least there's no central regulation at the federal level. Should there be? I think uh, the mortgage industry has changed so much. And we definitely used to have government, federal government regulation of the provision of mortgages through the SNLs. Uh, now we have mortgage brokers who are subject um, as far as I can tell, to uh, a minimal amount of regulation um, and oversight. And uh, we've heard about some pretty bad practices in the mortgage brokerage industry by a minority of, of participants, but nonetheless um, upsetting to us because we know that ultimately the spark that set off this blaze was in the subprime mortgage market and the mortgage market in general. So clearly we're going to have to look at mortgage originations, uh, how much oversight there should be, um, we also have to worry about whether or not, if a bank is going to package together a mortgage, um, would it be a good idea for the bank to be required to hold on to some of the mortgages? In a sense, to, as we say, um, keep some skin in the game. So to that make if sure they that implode, they the bank will lose some money yes. and it's not just passed on to somebody in Abu Dhabi or someplace. That's right. That's exactly right. To try to get the banks to think of themselves. I mean, it's a wonderful thing that we've uh, developed the financial market so we don't have an SNL um, in uh, Philadelphia that it goes under because it's uh, funding 30-year mortgages with uh, short-term deposits. I mean, that was an absolutely crazy system. Um, now we have the ability to uh, bundle together some mortgages, um, diversify them, and then sell them to institutional investors. What a wonderful thing. Securitization is such a sensible idea. But somehow we have to make sure that, um, that there's oversight, first of all, of the origination of the mortgages, and then that the packagers of the mortgages, whether they're commercial banks or investment banks, 
um, somehow pay a little more attention to the quality of the securities that they're developing. Um, and one way to do that would be to require that they have some capital invested in those same securities. So they'll share the losses. But, but these are the kinds of things that I think we have to think about. We have a change in, in the administration coming up. We have an election, changes in Congress. Um, after the election, I think people are going to have to sit down in Washington and really think through what would be the minimum, minimal amount of regulation which would make this system of ours safer, uh, which would make the mortgage um, system fairer to Americans and more sensible from the point of view of the stability of the financial system. But more generally, what, what is the minimal amount of regulation which will make uh, the financial sector as a whole safer? Well, this story is going to be running for quite some time, we can tell. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Marston. Thank you for inviting me. For more information, please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu. Thank you.